What's up guys, we're going to be taking a look at this lab, visible error-based SQL injection. We have an SQL injection attack vector, but the idea is we get an error-based response. Normally, if we're not retrieving information directly from the database, this means we have to maybe make use of a conditional SQL injection attack. In other words, a type of blind SQL injection where we enumerate the values in the database, making use of whether we get an error in response to various queries. However, sometimes it's possible to convert an error-based SQL injection attack into something that's visible. In other words, database values are reflected to the screen, despite the fact we're not technically getting the results of the query. Another way of putting this is we get an error in response, but we can actually cause the error to display certain pieces of information from the database, despite not returning the results of the query itself. All right, without further ado, let's fire up the lab. Now the injection attack occurs in a tracking ID. In other words, a type of cookie. The first thing I'm going to do is refresh the page just to give the page a chance to send a request to the server containing the tracking ID cookie. Here in Burp Repeater, we can see a copy of the request sent to the server. You can see cookie, tracking ID, and there's a value. Now this tracking ID on the back end is used as part of an SQL query. And if we inject a single quote into that query and send again to the back end, if we take a look at the render tab, we can see that we have a visible error reflected to the page. Furthermore, we actually have the erroneous SQL query itself. In other words, we have a verbose error disclosure here, which is something that should absolutely be disabled as part of a production website. There's no reason why we'd ever expose a visitor to the raw SQL query that's taking place on the back end. We can see that query, select all from tracking where ID equals, we see the ID of the tracking cookie and we see our injected single quote that has broken the SQL query. Now we know that SQL injection attacks make use of comment characters. So if we were to comment out the rest of the query, it wouldn't matter that there is a superfluous single quote as part of the query. So if I resend this request, including the comment characters, we are manipulating the request on the back end, but it's now a valid SQL query. Now this typically means we can make use of conditional errors to enumerate values in the database. However, notice that the attack vectors here involve some fairly long SQL queries. And in this particular case, there is a limitation, a character count limitation on the SQL queries that can be run on the back end. In other words, this probably wouldn't work here because the SQL queries themselves are too verbose. They won't be allowed in this particular lab. Having said this, we don't need to make use of conditional errors in this case because we have a visible error based SQL injection attack. Let's take a look at how that works. So this type of attack leverages the power of the database to cast or convert one data type into another data type. Let's expand on the SQL query here. And we know we're injecting directly into the query after the single quote. Cast, this is PostgreSQL running on the back end here. So syntax can vary. The Portswigger cheat sheet can help with this. We're going to cast. We have a subquery, which is select one. And we're going to choose how we want to cast this. We're going to cast it as an int. So this is instructing the database to take the first value, which is going to return one as a result of this subquery and cast it as an int. It's fairly straightforward to cast one as an int since it's already an int in this case. Even if it was a string, it would be very easy to cast this as an int. Let's send this to the back end. Notice we get a verbose error disclosure again. Argument of and must be type Boolean, not type integer. In other words, our query says select all where tracking ID equals blah and one, which doesn't make sense. We'd usually have a Boolean. So we'd have something like and one equals one, for example. So let's simply tag a one equals, and this query should now be valid because we're saying and one equals select one and cast it as an int and one equals one. Let's send this to the back end, and we can see we no longer get an error because this is now a valid SQL query. Now here's the interesting thing. If I select something that can't be casted as an int, for example, ABC, submit this to the back end. Notice we get the error response, invalid input syntax for type integer. Then we get the value of what's been selected exposed as part of the error message. So though this is not returning the direct results of the query, it's referencing the query itself, which contains the value of the subquery ABC in this case. Instead of ABC, let's try selecting username from users. 
Let's submit that to the back end. And now we get another error on terminated string literal. Now here's where we run into the character count limitation. The problem isn't that our query is invalid. It's simply that our entire query is not being taken into account here due to a character limit. As a result, we never quite reach the comment character as part of our SQL query. We then have the issue with the superfluous single quote, which actually breaks the query. Hence we get the error on terminated string literal. This is one of the reasons why we probably can't make use of the conditional error approach, the blind SQL approach to enumerate the database. Having said that, if we have a visible error-based SQL injection, it's superior to a fully blind SQL injection anyway, since we can simply read values from the screen. What we need to do here is try and shorten this query. Well, we don't really need that tracking ID. That's going to save us a few characters. Let's delete the tracking ID. We'll of course leave the single quote. Let's send that to the back end. Now we get the error, more than one row returned by a subquery used as an expression. So what's going wrong here? Well, we're selecting username from users. That's obviously going to return several rows from the database. We can't cast several rows from the database as an int. The subquery here is expected to return a single value that will then be attempted to be casted as an int. Well, we can force SQL to return a single row from the database. Hopefully we have enough characters for this. Limit one. So it's simply going to select the first result from the top of the database and not return any results after that. So this should help us to bypass this error because now we'll get a single row returned by the subquery due to limit one. Let's send that to the back end. We now get the error message invalid input syntax for type integer administrator. So remember, we saw how this subquery was exposing the value of its response in the error message. Well, that's exactly what's happening here. Select username from users limit one is being executed successfully. The value is administrator. The next step is the database is trying to cast administrator, which is a string as an integer. It can't do that. So it returns an error message. But as part of that error message, it exposes the value of that subquery administrator. So this is no longer blind SQL injection, but it's also not SQL injection where we are getting the full response from the database. We are in some ways, but it's actually being exposed as part of an SQL error message rather than actually being a response to the query itself. Well, we've extracted the username. Let's extract the password. And we don't need to add any additional clause to the query. When we specify limit one, it's always going to access the first row in the database. So the password we get back from this response will be from the same row as the username. So username administrator, password, we can then see the password exposed as a string. As we always mention in these labs, this value really should be the hash of a password, preventing us from making further progress until we attack the hash. But in this case, it is in fact a plain string. So let's look at the raw page source. We're going to grab the administrator password. And to solve the lab, we simply need to log in as administrator. So let's copy that to the clipboard. So here at the login page, we've entered administrator. Let's paste our password. Let's choose login. We've now accessed the administrator account and we get the flag. Congratulations, you solved the lab. So the basic idea here is that we were able to see the error response from the underlying database. And although we weren't able to see the response to our SQL query directly, we were able to make use of cast to manipulate the underlying database into providing an error that contained the value of the subquery, allowing us to read the results from the database directly. Now, if we take a quick look at the cheat sheet, we can see that forcing the database to convert one data type into another is going to depend on the underlying database. And I think in this case, this is just my opinion, the output is a little bit misleading because you might imagine that Microsoft is everything to do with the text below Microsoft. This section here is Microsoft. This section here is PostgreSQL. And this section here is MySQL. So we can see MySQL makes use of extract value. PostgreSQL is a database that makes use of cast, although it's not the only database that can do this. So from this, we're fairly sure that the underlying database is PostgreSQL, but it's also possible to confirm that with database version. We know that PostgreSQL has a syntax select version along with function scopes. So in this case, all it would be is a case of changing the subquery to select version as int. The version is not going to be castable as an int. It's then going to return the value of the subquery as part of the error message. Let's send that to the back end. Let's take a look at the render tab and we can see invalid input syntax for type integer 
PostgreSQL 12.17. We also get a range of additional information there, for example, the underlying operating system. All right, that's pretty much it for visible error-based SQL injection. Thanks for checking out the content. Catch you guys in the next lab.